Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. So I want to jump right into the message today. And while I was thinking about what to share today, and I was examining my own heart. I was like, Lord, you know, what should I share? And, and this came to mind is that we all want to, we, we came here today to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord, that's Jesus Christ. And our relationship with him, as we know him better, as we get to understand who he is, our engagement with him, the way we interact with him is different. And so this was a prayer that, you know, God, I've been praying about this. It's out of Ephesians 3, verses 18. It says this, And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. The prayer today is that we would have a better understanding of who God is in our life. So we can engage him in a different way as our father. So the title of this message is, God is our redeemer. God is our redeemer. And we're going to unpack that and, and why it's relevant to us today. And the primary text we're going to be looking at, we're going to look at several, but the primary story, the, the text we're going to look at is coming out of uh, Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And so what's going on here, God is talking to Moses and just letting him know, hey, I'm going to, it's time. I'm going to set my people free. He had been sending Pharaoh all kind of plagues and Egypt all kind of plagues and, and really just telling him, hey, you had better let my people go. But to this point, he hadn't. He would, but then he'd hem haw and go back. So that's kind of the context. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. But here, here's a conversation that God has with, with Moses in verse 1 in, in chapter 6 of Exodus says, Then the Lord told Moses, Now you will see what I would do to Pharaoh when he feels the force of my strong hand. He will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them under its terms. I promised to give them the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I am, I am well aware of my covenant with them Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. So this is a, a conversation that God tells Moses to go and tell the people that he was going to let them go. He was going to take them out of their bondage. And so for a little more of context of what's going on here the Israelites were living in Egypt, and when they first got there, things were, were good. We're talking about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. Jacob had a son. His name was Joseph. God had raised Joseph up to be the highest, the second highest in the land. It was only Pharaoh that was above him. In fact, the Bible says that there, there was nothing done in Egypt that didn't get Joseph signature. Nothing, nothing happened without his, his endorsement that it was okay. So things were okay. Things were really, really good for the Israelites while Joseph was in the land, while he ruled. Things were good. 
But over time, it changed. And we see this in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Because don't you know things change? Things don't always stay the same. So it says here, Exodus 1, verse 8, eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So this is what happened. They're, they're, they ended up being in, in bondage. And a lot of horrible things happened. They even were throwing their, their newborn boys into the Nile River. Terrible, terrible situation that they were in. But Israel was God's people that had been put in bondage. But God was going to show up in their life. Don't you know that? Just like he does for us, God always shows up in our life. And I like how he says, too, that he had heard their groans. He knew what was going on in our life. God knew exactly. He's a good father. He knows what's happening. So in our main text, God identifies himself to Moses as Lord. But this wasn't the first encounter that Moses had had with, with God. The first one was, was at the, the burning bush. And even then, you can see Moses' relationship change. Because at first, when, when Moses first meets God, he's afraid, you know, and he's, he, he's God does, um, turns his staff into a, a snake and he gives him leprosy, but heals them. He was just showing them that he's God and what he could do. But Moses was afraid. But over time, you could see Moses' relationship change with God. And the same thing about that with, with the patriarchs, because at first he said that the Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacobs, the patriarchs, they didn't know me the way that the people are going to know me now. Because they knew him as God Almighty. And when you look at that in Hebrew, it means El Shaddai. It means powerful, to be burly, large, bodily size, stout, sturdy. Like, huh? You know it, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> makes, you think, <laughs> makes you think about Atlas. You ever seen the, uh, I don't know if they show it anymore, Atlas holding up the world. I was like, man, that. God's got galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. Whew. We serve a big God. God is the God of Dover, Delaware. He's the God of El Salvador. He's the God of Japan. He's the God. Of hey. We serve a big God. That's how the patriarchs knew him. Like, whew, God is big. But then he was saying that well, they didn't know me, though. They didn't know me as, as Jehovah. They didn't know me as Yahweh. And that the meaning of that is to be or he is or, or I am. And, and that's the, the, the definition that, that God gave to Moses when they first had the encounter at the burning bush. And we look at that in Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. This is what God, this is the exchange between God and Moses when, when Moses asked him, who are you? Verse 13, it says, but Moses protests if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So I was, was studying, I was doing some digging and I, I came across some, some theologians, they had some commentary on that and, and a couple of these. The first one is uh, Dorian uh, Covey Cox. He says, now the Israelites would see the truth of the names meaning displayed before them. 
they would come to know by experience the Lord as their covenant keeping God. And the next one I saw was, was John Hannon. And he says this, God meant that now he was revealing himself to Moses not only as a sustainer, provider, God Almighty, not only did, he, he, did they know him this way, they were going to know him as the promise keeper, the one who was personally, the one that was personally related to his, to his people and would redeem them. So God was about to abide with his people. He was going to lead them by a cloud in the day and a pillow of fire at night. He was going to be with them, just like he's with us, Emmanuel, God with us. That was what's was getting ready to happen. And you know, it's always been God's desire to be with his people. Sometimes we have a, a, a tainted or distorted view of, of God. We look at the God of the Old Testament, oh, he's me, you know, and Jesus, oh, he's good. God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He's always been good. He's always been good. Yeah, we, we can clap for that. Amen. He's always been good. And he's always wanted to dwell with his people. Always. But there's sin. <laughs> we see it in, in, in the garden. And it separates. But God had a plan to redeem as well. In Exodus 6.6, 6, it says this. It says, therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. So God uses the word to redeem. He's going to redeem. And so when you look at that word in the Hebrew, it means gale. And the meaning of that is to redeem, to act as a, a kinsman or near kinsman, which really is a very special meaning, especially for the Hebrews back in, in, in their time. Because a near kinsman was a relative that would restore a person's property, someone's property, or even their person, if it had been lost usually to a, a debt, a near kinsman would reinstate what once belonged to their relative. Wow. He'd bring it all back, that near kinsman. And we want to look at a, a story real quick at, at Ruth, because this is a, a Naomi. This is a story of, of being redeemed. So I'll give you a little background to what's going on here. There's a lady named Naomi and her husband, Elimelech. They lived in Judah, Bethlehem, Judah, in fact. Had two sons. A drought comes and they decide to move to Moab while the drought is, is going on in, in Judah. So while they're there, the two sons marry Moabite ladies. But over a course of time, Elimelech dies. Naomi's husband dies. And not only that, within a span of 10 years after he dies, both sons die. So Naomi, she hears that God has, has visited Judah. They've gotten rain. Things are, are looking better. So she decides to go back to, to Judah. And so she encourages the daughter-in-laws, hey, you guys stay here. You're still young. You still have your whole life ahead of you. Remarry and, you know, raise up families. I can't have any more kids for you. She said, I can't do it. But Ruth is persistent. She's like, no, I'm going with you. Wherever you go, I'm, I'm going to go. Whoever your God is, that's going to be my God. And so she clings to, clings to, to Naomi. So they go back to uh, Judah but things are not good. It's been a long time. And we find this account in Ruth chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Ruth kind of, I'm sorry, Naomi kind of gives a description of what her life was like. She's having a conversation with some other ladies. And she says this, don't call me Naomi, she responded. 
Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi's name was, it meant to be sweet, sweetness or something pleasant. But she's like, hey, I'm not worthy of that name. God has, God has caused me to suffer. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. I have a bitter life right now. We could feel that way sometimes. My life is bitter. So the conditions aren't good. So what happens is Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law, she decides to go and glean. And glean means to pick up wheat that has fallen on the sides of the field. Poor people could do that back then. And and so she's gleaning. and, And wouldn't you know by God's providence, she gleans in a field that belongs to a near kinsman of Naomi named Boaz. God knows, <laughs> God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. Naomi, she recognizes this. She's like, huh, he's a near kinsman. There's some redemption that could take place right here. So she has a conversation with, with Ruth. And we find this, this conversation happening in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 in, in the book of Ruth. It says, One day Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you, Take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes like, Gary, go, go get yourself right. We're going to turn ahead today. We're going to get redeemed. <laughs> then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there, and he will tell you, what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quickly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. And this is Ruth's response right here. She said, she replied, spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. God used Boaz to redeem Naomi and Ruth. And it wasn't Boaz that was doing it. It was God. God orchestrated it all. So what are some takeaways for us as we look at this today and how it impacts us? And I would say the first thing is that God desires to be present in our lives. God desires to be present in our lives. God told Moses that his relationship was about to change with his people. He was going to dwell with his people and that's, that's who we are. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us, teaching us all things. God was with the Israelites when they departed Egypt, wherever they went. He was there. And God has promised us too that he's never going to leave us. That's his promise to us. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail nor fail you nor abandon you. Now, I know there's a lot of different definitions of love and one being sacrificial. 
But when I think about love, I think about commitment, you know, regardless what happens there, (laughs) you're there. That's how God is for us. He doesn't waver back and forth. God is there. He's steadfast. His love for us is steadfast. He's not going anywhere. It's us that tend to wander like sheep. But God is, is consistent. He's there. And, you know, when Moses went to tell the people that God was, hey, God is going to deliver you. It's time. You know, I know it's been 430 years, but it's time. We're getting out of here. The people had a hard time receiving that because they had been in so much suffering. So in Exodus 6, verse 9, it says this. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord has said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. So even though God had told them that, hey, this, we're, we're getting out of here. We're going to be set free. Because of their troubles, they couldn't receive it. And that can be us. You ever had somebody tell you something really, really good, remind, remind us of God's promise, but we, we can't receive it because of what we're going through, the troubles that we're going through. We may even be in, in a state of mind like Naomi. Naomi said God had made her bitter. Sometimes we can be blaming God. Naomi had lost a husband and she had lost two sons. She had a significant loss. She, her life was bitter. We may be in that place, but I can tell you this. God wants us to put our trust in him and not in our circumstances. He don't want us to be trusting our circumstances. Our, church, our circumstance could be rotten. I'm, I'm, I'm a care pastor, so I, I'm in the hospital all the time. I, 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 I'm about by bedsides all the time. I know situations aren't always good. But God doesn't want us to focus on that. He wants to focus on him. He wants us to put our attention and our eyes on him because even in our suffering, he's with us. On the story of Naomi and Ruth, when Naomi showed back up with, in Judah with uh, Ruth, that wasn't a good thing. Ruth was a Moabite. She was a foreigner. They didn't get along. And so she comes back home. Nothing brings a foreigner. But I can tell you God was in the midst. This is how it works. Boaz marries Ruth. Boaz and Ruth, they have a son. His name is Obed. Obed has a son. His name is Jesse. Jesse has a son. His name is David. David becomes the king of Israel. Matter of fact, a king after God's own heart. And that same lineage would come our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the very one that we celebrated today, thanking him for shedding his blood for us. Same lineage. That's the goodness of God. Even in our midst, we might not necessarily see what's going on, but God is right there in the midst. I'm sure Naomi didn't really see how Ruth was going to be a blessing in her life, but man, did he. Did he. That's true for us. Sometimes we can't see what God is doing in our life, but he's there. But we have to wait on him. And we have to wait in faith. Our timeline has to be calibrated. You know, we, we want things to happen in a certain way, on a certain schedule, our way. We want things done our way. We're not in charge. <laughs> and God knows better. But we have to trust that. We have to trust that God is good. And we have to trust that he has a plan for our life. The second thing is that God will fulfill his promise. Don't you know God is not forgetful? Like, Lord, I think you forgot. You know, it's been a a minute. 
God does not forget. Exodus 6, verse 5, I, I love this. It says, this is God speaking here to Moses. He says, you can be sure that I have heard the groans of my people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians, and I am well aware of my covenant with them. God is well aware what's going on in our life. God is well aware of the tears that you have shed. There is not one tear that dropped off your face that God did not see. He is well aware. And not only that, he knows that he's our father. He knows the covenant that he has with us, that he's our redeemer. He has not forgotten. God does not forget. Even though it's been, had been over 400 years, God had not forgotten. So the question is for us is, what are we believing God for? What are we asking God to redeem us of? What have we been waiting for, for God to show up in our life? Is it salvation for our, our spouse? Salvation for our, our, our kids? Is it healing in our body? Is it provision? Every one of us got a need in here. Because you know how I know? We're not in heaven. It looks, it looks different. Everybody got a different situation going on. But we all have a need. And so what God is saying is that I, I, I'm the I am. I'm going to meet that need. God's going to honor his word. I can't tell you when. I can't give you a timeline. I can't tell you when God's going to show up. I can tell you he's going to honor his word. Joshua 21, verses 43 and 45, it says this. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors. And they took possession of it and settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had solemnly promised the ancestors. None of the enemies could stand against them, for the Lord helped them conquer all their enemies. And verse 45 says this. It says, not one, not a single one of all the good promises the Lord had given to the family of Israel was left unfulfilled. Everything he had spoken came true. Everything that God says, it's going to come to pass. You can take that to the bank. God's going to honor his word. The third thing is this. God will, re he will redeem us. God will redeem us. The whole story of the Bible is a story of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. And we get a snapshot in Exodus 6 of, of God saying, I am your redeemer. I am your near kinsman. Now, there was a prerequisite for a uh, redeemer, near kinsman. It couldn't just be anybody. And the first thing, in, a near kinsman was the closest relative. And Boaz was not the closest relative to Ruth. There was actually one other. But he wasn't willing. So I, I know we have people close to us. We're sitting close to people right now. But God is to be the closest person in our life. He is to be the close. He's our father. He's our redeemer. He's the closest person to us. And we have to think about that sometimes. Because sometimes we can, we can get things out of order. The next thing is that the near kinsman needed the resources to restore what the relative had lost. And we already talked about that. God is El Shaddai. He's, the <laughs> He's got more than enough. Isaiah 44, 24, it says it this way. This is what the Lord says. Your redeemer and creator. Again, God calls himself the redeemer. I am the Lord who made all things. I alone stretched out the heavens. Who was with me? When I made the earth, God made the earth. It's not a coincidence. It's not an evolution. It's not a random particles getting together. It's a design. 
God made it. So I don't know what we're trusting God for, but I can tell you that God is the I am. He is what we need. He is more than what we need. And the third thing is a near kinsman had to be, had to be willing to. John 10, verse 14, it says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Jesus was willing to give his life for us. He willingly did that. There's always a cost for the, the near kinsman. The reason why the relative didn't want to redeem Naomi and Ruth was because it was going to cost him something. When you redeem a relative, that means somebody has died. And so the re, their near redeemer has to come in and reestablish that. So there could be a, a circumstance where his inheritance is split or it may take on the deceased name. So that relative didn't want to do it. Boaz was willing. God was willing to do that for us. Our redemption came at a cost. It cost him his life. What else can somebody give more than their life? I can give you a whole bunch of stuff. I can give you a car, I can give you a house, but I don't give you my life. God was willing to give it all. What else could he do? Sometimes we're still looking for things from God. And God's like, what else, what else do you want? I've given my life. So as I close, we talked about God being our near kinsman. And the thing about a, a near kinsman, they're a relative, right? Boaz was a, he was a relative of Naomi. We have to be in the family of God for God to be our near kinsman, our redeemer. We have to be in the family for him to spread his covering over us. And the only way that happens is to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus is willing. He gave his life already. That's the thing about it is, even before we wanted to be in his family, his door was open for us. Come into the family. Come in under the covering. That's the love of God that will transform your life. You will be a different person when you grab a hold of, of who God is and what, he, what he's done for us. So we want to pray. If you have not given your, your heart to the Lord or decided to be in the family of God, we want to pray that God would move in your heart today. And, and the second thing is, if we've been dealing with things for a, a long time and been waiting on God and he hadn't shown up yet, we want to pray that our hope would be restored because he hears every, every groan, he hears every cry, and he has not forgotten. God is not forgetful. So it's our prayer that, that we would see God in our midst. Because this is the thing. God is always bringing us out of something or he's given us the grace to go through something. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit is long suffering. He enables us to go through something. His grace is always going to be sufficient. Always. So we're going to pray for those two things. And if the prayer team can come forward and, and just be ready to, to receive people, if do, people do come forward. But I want to pray for you. If, if you have not decided to be in the family of God, God is, he's willing. The question is, are we? And if you're watching online and, and if you want to come forward, you can definitely come for it. Somebody will pray for you. I'll pray for you myself. The work has been done. It's for us to receive. And you can pray a prayer just like this. 
Lord, thank you for, for loving me. Even when I didn't know that you loved me, even when I didn't want you in my life, you wanted me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart, Lord, and help me to live for you. And Lord, we pray for the, the people here that, Lord, they already belong to you. They, they're in the family, but Lord, they're going through some things. Lord, their, their hope has been, been distorted by their circumstance. So that, Father, I pray that in Jesus' name that they would know that you are their redeemer and that you see every cry, you hear every groan, Lord, you hear every suffering, Father, and you're in their midst. And you have a plan, Lord, for their life. Lord, I pray, Father, you send a rest in their life. Let them rest in your faithfulness, Lord. Let them know, Father, that you are Jehovah. You are the God that I am. You are exactly what they need, Lord. We thank you for your promises, Lord. They won't hit the floor. You're going to honor your word, Father. In fact, Father, we thank you for sending your word, Father, to heal your people, to restore your people, Father. Thank you for hearts that are open and, and ready to receive, Lord. So, Father, as we, we close this service, Lord, as people may come down even after, we thank you, Father. We thank you for the people that have said that they are following you. We, we're going to baptize 28 people just to have to this service, Lord. We thank you for that. It's a celebration of what you've done on the inside. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.